Good morning, First Baptist Church of Ocean Way, and welcome to Virtual Reality. Uh, sorry about the short delay there, but we had a few technical difficulties. I am the Frito Bandino with some announcements for you today. Daily devotion, weekdays at 12 p.m. Don't forget that. Tune in and their blessing uh, with, uh, we heard Brother Micah and Brother Jordan and Brother and, of course, uh, Miss uh, Kelly. And it's just great every day to hear them bring the devotional to us. Also, uh, make sure you join us every Sunday and Wednesday for our uh, Sunday morning uh, service at 11 o'clock and our Wednesday evening service at 7 p.m. And you, all you wonderful youth out there, it's, it's nice seeing you and and just whenever y'all have those quarantine games that Jordan came up with, I tell you, I, I am so impressed you're doing such a great job. And those sandwiches you made, I tell you, they look delicious and I would have ate every one of them. I tell you, they, they were some awesome sandwiches. And hopefully when this is over with, y'all make me some sandwiches like that. And uh, also, you don't forget every day for your daily devotional, go to your youth out and make sure you do that. And all other activities is canceled with the exception of uh, the food pantry. And while we're on the food pantry, I'd like to thank everybody that uh, donated uh, last month uh, to it. With y'all's help, we were able to provide food to 43 families, and that, that was a true blessing. And the main thing was being able to minister to them. And don't forget, today is Others First Sunday. And I'd like to thank everyone that's already uh, dropped off their donations of food and money. And uh, we'll be here until 1230 if there's anyone else that would like to drop anything off. Also, you can drop it off between 430 and 6 p.m. Uh, tonight. And don't forget your tithing. today and everything you can continue doing that at the same time but it's very important because the church has this budget needs they have to make weekly and please continue to be faithful with your tithing and the one last thing I have we're going to have a good Friday service at seven o'clock for all you military men and women out there that's 1900 hours uh, and we're going to do something really really neat and it's going to be a first time thing we're going to have communion online, and we're going to have these individual communion cups that has the bread and the wine in it, uh, and we'll be getting with you a little bit later this week and let you know when you can drop by here and pick them up, and I tell you, it's going to be great and looking forward to it, and it's just going to be wonderful. Again, thank you all for joining us, and if we have any visitors out there, welcome to First Baptist Church of Ocean Way, and with that, Brother Jordan. Uh, you're on the other side. <laughs> All right, good morning. And uh, we're Baptist. That's not real wine. It's Welch's. Uh, just want to let y'all know on that. I right, got to make that distinction. Um, but before we get into the word this morning, um, our big announcement, our Easter service is going to be a drive-in service here at the First Baptist Church Ocean Way. It's going to be on the property. Um, we were able to coordinate with the city, and after much prayer and and not how great in the minds they were, uh, but we decided that we were going to have a drive-in service. Um, there will be maps that are posted throughout the week uh, telling us how to park, um, what it's kind of going to look like. We'll have it all mapped for Easter Day. We have our Easter service here at the church in a drive-in. Um, we do need to make note that you do have to stay in your cars. Please do not get out of here for any reason whatsoever. Um, if for whatever reason you would need um, to get out of your car, you will have to leave the, the, the area, go do what you need to go do. Um, but we have to follow the CD got, CDC guidelines and follow the, um, our leader's orders. And they are telling us um, not to let anyone out of their vehicles. Okay. Um, but this is Psalm Sunday, Palm Sunday, excuse me. English is hard. Um, so we are going to read the triumphal entry this morning where Jesus comes riding in on a donkey. And starting in verse 1, it says, Now when they came to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie 
by them and come to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Zechariah, Zechariah 9 9, saying, uh, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus. Jesus had brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, Who is this? And the crowd says, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you that you started on a mission, Lord, and you did not, you did not stop. That, Lord, you came to restore our relationship, Lord. You came so we may have salvation in you. Thank you for that, Lord. But ultimately, Lord, it's for your glory that you did this. And may you be blessed, Lord. Thank you for how you're working in our lives. Lord, may this time of worship find good soil in you. That we don't let those words fall on the the hard surface, Lord, but we let it get rooted into our hearts, Lord, and, and that we let that be an outward expression of you. Just thank you for this time of worship. Thank you that we're able to worship, Lord, and there's so many prayer needs, Lord. But may you be glorified. May you be honored. Be with us, Lord. May your will be done. Nothing more, nothing less. We love you, Jesus. Amen.
this time. Yeah, we're going to do the welcome, right? Okay. So guys, we kind of did this last week, um, but let's break it down a little bit more specifically. So for our welcome time, we're going to do posts on Facebook like last week, but Misty has gone ahead and already posted on our group on the FPCO, uh, FPC Ocean Way members group page, whatever you want to call it. Um, so instead of making your own post, just go ahead and use that same co uh, comment thread. So just comment rather than go to post. Just go ahead and comment your pictures. That way it's all in the same thread and all in the same place. So Misty's already done it. So go and comment with your photos of you guys tuning in, watching the service. And that's how we'll do it. So take a few minutes and do that. For today's reading, I have chosen a hymn um, from 1850 by Charles Smith, and um, he was a Methodist preacher during this time, 
and the title is Immortal, Invisible God, Only Wise. Immortal, Invisible God, Only Wise. In light, inaccessible, hid from our eyes. Most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days. Almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. Unresting, unhasting, and silent as light. Nor wanting, nor wasting, thou rulest in might. Thy justice like mountains, high soaring above. Thy clouds, which are fountains of goodness and love. To all life thou givest, to both great and small. In all life thou livest, the true life of all. We blossom and flourish as leaves on a tree, and wither and perish, but not changes thee. Great Father of glory, pure Father of light, thine angels adore thee, all veiling their sight. All laud we would render, O help us to see, tis only thy splendor of light hideth thee. Immortal, invisible, God only wise, in light inaccessible, hid from our eyes. Most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise.
our Father. We are free indeed. If we know you, we know your love and your grace. Forgive us for where we've fallen short, dear God, and praise be to your name for your love, your glory, dear God. We just seek your word. Just bring us your word. Help us to be bold witnesses like Paul. And even though we're isolated, dear God, may we declare your glories, your love, both here and forevermore in your precious and holy name. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, you may be seated. I tell you, this has been a, um, a wild time for us uh, as a church and for me, um, preaching with not many people here and uh, learning how to do that and still trying to figure out how to do that. We do have a few people spread out today. Um, we are social distancing in this place, so we are, are spread out, but um, just working on this, working through this, trying um, our best. So thankful to be able to have live worship at um, it does something to my heart to prepare me for this time, and I pray it does uh, for you. So we're um, in, in a small little setting. We are getting after it in the worship of, of, of God. Um, this morning I woke up, and uh, I've got a sty on my eye, and my eye was swollen shut. So my bad eye, left eye, is still bad, still blurry, and now my right eye is all messed up. So I can't see really good out of one eye and can't see really good out of the other. So we'll see how this goes this morning, but if you do have your Bibles, I want to invite you to open with me to Matthew 17. Matthew 17, and welcome to week five of our Mountains and Valleys series where we are walking through events from Scripture, the highest points of life or in life's lowest valleys. And as we've stated all along, our plan is to go through the mountains first. Um, on Friday night at our Good Friday service, Pastor Jordan's going to be taking on Mount Calvary, and then on Sunday. Sunday uh, in service here at the church. So excited about that at 10 a.m. Um, I'll be unpacking the mountaintop of all um, events in scripture, which is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And just think about the mountains that we have seen so far. We've seen mountains of sacrifice, mountains of law, law mountains of the with Elijah, the prophets, the people of Israel, mountains of temptation, as we saw last week in the temptation of Christ. And this morning, and we come to the Mount of Transfiguration. And I'm about to, I'm about to make a statement, and then I'm going to try to dig myself out of that statement. And I'm pretty good. I'm a professional at that because I'm a husband. So I'm, I'm pretty good at making statements and having to dig out of those statements. Somewhere Misty is at home saying amen to that. But I'm going to make a statement, try to dig out of it, and let's see how. So in thinking about the ministry of Christ, we sometimes forget just how strange Jesus was. We forget just how strange he was. He did a lot of odd things during his time on earth. Think about this. He cursed trees. He ordered his followers not to tell anyone who he was. He associated and talked with people um, that the religious leaders said that he shouldn't associate with or talk to. Um, he told parables in order to deliberately confuse people. He claimed to be by the Father while also claiming not to know certain things that the Father himself knows. And then there's this moment on this mountain where Jesus' face and clothes start shining for no apparent reason. And then two dead guys show up and start talking with him. Now, maybe this doesn't um, strike us as crazy because we've named this event the Transfiguration. As though if we label it sometimes or somehow it helps us make more sense of it. But what we know is this moment that we're looking at this morning is a dramatic moment in the life of Christ. In fact, it's the most dramatic moment um, in the life of Christ between his birth and the cross. So this morning, I, I want us to see, and I'm going to lay before us this morning, a probably the most magnificent, most breathtaking, most worship-evoking picture of Christ in all of the Gospels. Yet all of this, what we're about to read, wasn't for Jesus' sake. All of this was for his disciples, the three that were with him, for their sake and 2,000 years later for our sake. The 18th century uh, poet William Blake declared, we become like what we behold. We become like what we behold, which reminds me of the short story, The Great Stone Face, published by Nathaniel um, 
Hawthorne in 1850. Um, myself and Kelly focus on that year, 1850. Um, and this story it, it, it's a story which tells of a valley filled with inhabitants. And overlooking the valley was a mountain on which was etched the face of a man. One day a little boy named Ernest sat listening to his mother tell the story of the great stone face. She told him of the legend that promised one day a man with exactly that face would come and visit their village and would be a blessing to all. Ernest longed for the legend to manifest itself. At the end of each day, he would sit and gaze at the face for many hours, studying its contours, dreaming about the blessing the person with the great stone face would someday be for his village. Through the years, rumors would circulate that one with the resemblance of the great stone face had indeed arrived in the village. Ernest would rush in his excitement to see the person only to realize quickly that the rumors were false. As he aged, Ernest became well known in his region for his wisdom and his care. Then one evening, as Ernest was standing in front of this mountain, from his heart, people um, that were there saw him suddenly with an irresistible impulse. The people Behold, Ernest is himself the likeness of the great stone face. You see, Ernest never considered the great stone face could actually be him. What he did is spent his time focused, gazing, thinking, considering, but ultimately beholding the great stone face each and every day. Let me say it again. We become like what we behold we behold is what we become. So again this morning, I want to place before you a glorious picture of Christ. Even more glorious and even more mysterious than a great stone face. For what we're about to see is the Son of God with His divinity bursting forth from His humanity. So let's look at Matthew 17 verses 1 through 8 together. And it says this, And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to him Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you. And Lord, the last two words of that section are the two words that I pray, God, we set our hearts to this very day. Jesus only. Only Jesus. Today, just show us, oh God, your glory through the glory of your Son, that we would behold your glory today in the face of Jesus Christ. And that we would, God, become like what we behold. Lord, lead us into more of you. Lead us, God, into your beauty, into your glory, into your grace and your, your mercy. To show forth yourself, God, we ask through your word. Speak, O oh God, for we are listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So think about this. In coming down um, to earth from heaven, Jesus laid aside his glory. Think about the words of Christ in John 17, 5. Jesus says, And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So Jesus said, I had a glory with you, Father, before the world existed. I think of the words of Martin Lloyd-Jones who said this, and this, this is an amazing quote. He said, The implications being that something has happened to that glory. And that is precisely the teaching of the New Testament. 
In order to become man, Jesus had to lay aside this eternal glory which he had with the Father in heaven. I'm not saying that he laid aside his deity because he did not. Jesus was and is and forever will be God. What he did lay aside was the glory of his deity. He did not cease to be God, but he ceased to manifest the glory of God. Or think of it like this. The glory is there, still shining in all of its power, but a veil of flesh has come over it so that mankind cannot see it. So the whole point is this. Man was added to Christ. God was not lost from him. Jesus is the perfect God man. He emptied himself, not by losing what he was, but by taking on what he was not. He didn't lose his deity. He took on flesh. He took on humanity. So with the remainder of our time this morning, I want to lay before us or place before us four pictures of Christ. And I want to ask you this morning to behold his glory, behold his majesty, behold him. Look to him. Look, stare, meditate upon him this morning. So truth number one, Jesus radiates the perfection of God. Jesus radiates the perfection of God. So in one sense, the transfiguration was God's seal of approval of Peter's confession of Christ. So in the previous chapter, Matthew 16, when Jesus said, Who do you say that I am? Peter said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Son of God. So this is kind of God's approval, but it was also God's encouragement to Jesus as he began to make his way to the cross. Matthew, in searching for words to describe what happened, wrote in verse 2, And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became um, as white or white as light. In a parallel account, Mark wrote, And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. That's Mark 9, 3. Luke would put it this way in Luke 9, 29. As he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. Just think about these three men trying to put into words, struggling to find the words to explain what happened. All Matthew can think about is sun, a sun bursting forth um, from inside of a person, bursting forth from his skin. All Luke is focused on is something altering in the face of, of Christ and, and whiteness and brilliance or dazzling um, white. And then, of course, Mark says Clorox. Is, is bleach. That's what comes to, to his mind. But these men are struggling for words to describe what's happening here. And ultimately, the word transfigure describes a change on the outside that comes from the inside. The word there literally is metamorpho or metamorphosis. So as Jesus walked this world, he was seen in weakness. He was seen in humiliation but during this time on this mountain with the three disciples, he was seen by them in all of his glory. And understand this, Jesus' glory was not a reflective glory. It was a radiating glory, meaning it did not come from without. The glory came from within. Or another, okay, another way to put it is Jesus is not the moon. He's not reflecting the sun. Jesus is the sun. He is radiating the glory of God. To put it a different way, we are the moon. We are the reflective ones. We reflect the glory of God. As we spend time in the presence of God, we reflect that glory. We become like what we behold. Jesus is the Son. He's never becoming. He is who He is and forever will be radiating the glory of God. So Jesus radiates the perfection of God. Secondly, Jesus realizes the plan of God. Or another way to say that is Jesus accomplishes the plan of God. He realizes or accomplishes the plan of God. In verse 3, Matthew says, Behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And sometimes we just kind of gloss over that and we forget the fact that 1400 years since Moses died, 700 plus 
um, years had passed since Elijah was taken up into heaven. Here we are in this moment talking with Jesus. And the question becomes, why these two figures? Why Moses and why Elijah? And some people just say, well, both of these men had their most intimate experiences um, with God on mountains. So here they are, but it goes so much deeper than that. Here's what we know. Moses was the great law giver. Elijah was the greatest of the prophets. So the point that's being made here is that the law and the prophets both pointed to Jesus. That's the point. That's why Moses is there as the lawgiver. That's why um, Elijah's there as the prophet. They both point to Jesus. That, that's the, the point of it all. Everything about the law is fulfilled in Christ. And every prophecy in the Old Testament somehow, someway hungers for the coming of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, in Luke 24, 27, at the end of um, Jesus' ministry, after the resurrection, it tells us when Jesus was on the road with these two men to Emmaus, it says, And beginning at Moses and the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So he pointed, he showed them how the scriptures, the law and the prophets point to him. Here's the point for us today. It all centers on him. He is the center of everything. All of history either points to Jesus or all of history flows from Jesus. This is a great time to just pause at home and say, Amen. It all centers on him. But secondly, and this gets even better, Moses and Elijah appear to show us that those who have gone before us are in safekeeping um, and God will keep his word. And here's the beauty here. Moses represents those who through death will be in glory. Moses represents those who are dead in Christ. Elijah represents those who without death, through a calling up, through a rapture, will be in glory. So Moses died, God hid his body, but Elijah was taken up to heaven. And then there's another truth that rises to the surface, and that is this, that our identity will not end at death. We were created for all of eternity. We will never cease to exist, and we will never become someone else. The Bible um, emphasizes the continuity between this life and the next, meaning Moses is still Moses, Elijah is still Elijah, and our identity will continue for all eternity. But let me add this. So will what we do with Jesus. It will continue for all of eternity. If we reject him now, that will continue for all of eternity. If we um, bow the knee to him now, that will continue for all of eternity. Yet the ultimate point here is the glory of Christ. Um, Luke adds to this encounter, and Luke says this, in Luke 9, 30 and 31, And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. So Moses and Elijah stood with Jesus talking about his exodus, talking about what he was about to endure and go through in a few short days. Think about this. In a few short days from this, the face of Jesus... Would, who, who is now shining and radiating, that same face would be battered, bruised, scourged, and beaten. He would be so disfigured as to become unrecognizable. A crown of thorns would be forced on his head. And after six hours hanging on a cross, the light in his face would go out and his eyes would be darkened in death. And what the disciples needed to know is that it would not end for him in death, but it would end for Jesus in glory. And this is the point that's being made. Jesus is giving them a glimpse of the future while not ignoring the cross. Even in this moment while Jesus is radiating the glory of God, he's talking with Moses and Elijah about what's coming. The cross is coming. But here's the beauty there's glory for Jesus now, and there was a glory that laid beyond the cross. In the words of Oswald Chambers, the transfiguration was completed on the Mount of Ascension. If Jesus 
Jesus had gone to heaven directly from the Mount of Transfiguration, he would have gone alone. He would have gone alone. He would have been nothing more to us than a glorious figure. But he turned his back on that glory and came down from the mountain to identify himself with fallen humanity. Jesus realizes or accomplishes the plan of God for us. Then third, Jesus reveals the presence of God. So Jesus reveals the presence of God. For the glory of this moment is not just about the moment. The glory is not just about a location. It's not just about the disciples that were there or Moses and Elijah. The glory of this moment is about the person of Jesus Christ. And yet it gets better because in verse 5 it says he was still speaking. So Peter was still speaking. It's kind of funny in scripture um, three times Peter is interrupted while he's speaking. One time by Jesus, one time by God the Father, and then one time by God the Holy Spirit. I mean that's quite a, a card. I mean if you're going to get interrupted... Go ahead and go, go big, Peter. Go big. So he's interrupted here. And it says, and behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. A bright cloud now comes on the scene, which takes us back to the Old Testament, which was always a picture of the presence of God. It was through a cloud that God led his people by day and by night. It was through a cloud that God protected his people. In Exodus 14, a cloud came from... Um, before the people to behind them to protect them from Egypt that was coming. It was a cloud that descended on Mount Sinai when Moses met God to receive the law. It was a cloud that filled the tabernacle when it was completed and later filled the temple when it was dedicated. The cloud is also, get this, a prophecy. In future, or in the future, 1 Thessalonians 4 says that believers will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. This is a beautiful thing. Peter, James, and John were to put their arms around this blessed experience and they were to pull this experience to themselves, especially in the days that were to come. And so must we. For this is our hope. Someday we are going to be in that cloud. The Shekinah glory is going to surround us. Yet in this moment... In this moment that we see in Matthew 17, the glory is radiating from him. He is the presence of God. Don't miss this. Jesus tells us that our God is near. Jesus tells us that our God has come. Jesus is revealing to us the presence of God, which leads us to truth number four. Jesus represents the pleasure of God. Jesus represents God. 17.5, it says, And a voice from the cloud said, This is the voice of God the Father. This is my beloved Son, when, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to Him. On three separate times in the life of Jesus, the Father speaks from heaven. First, at Jesus' baptism in Matthew 3, God the Father says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Here at the Transfiguration, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to Him. And then in John 12, as Jesus approached the cross, Jesus prayed, God, glorify Your name. And um, God the Father said, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. But the, de the declaration here in Matthew 17 and Matthew 3 is identical, except for at the very end of Matthew 17, God the Father says, listen to him. Don't miss this. Peter had just got done asking the Lord if he could make three tents. One for Jesus, one for Moses, one for Elijah. In making this statement, though, Peter missed the mark in two ways. First of all, it was not the will of God for his son to come to earth and then hang out on a mountain avoiding all suffering. That wasn't the will of God. That wasn't the plan of God. And then secondly, it is never good or wise or pleasing to God for us to elevate any man to the level of Jesus. And this is what Peter does. These men, Moses and Elijah, were amazing men of God, yet they were also just mere servants. Jesus is the Son. 
We're not just talking about a human teacher here. We're talking about God in the flesh. Therefore, listen to him. This week, as I studied the parallel versions of this story in Mark 9 and Luke 9, Mark 9, 6, and of course, Mark got his information from Peter. So Mark 9, 6 tells that the reason that Peter said what he said was, in Mark 9, 6, he did not know what to say. So because he did not know what to say, he just opened his mouth and said, let's build three tents here, Jesus, for you and for Moses and for Elijah. But here's some advice for us. And please hear this with love. And this is not just advice for you. This is advice for me too. When we find ourselves in the presence of God and we don't know what to say, keep our mouth shut. When we find ourselves in his presence and we don't know what to say, just keep our mouths closed and open our ears and open our eyes to see his glory. But let me end this way. I'm going to kind of switch gears just a second. What if the glory that burst forth from Jesus on that mountain wasn't just divine glory? What if it was human glory as well? Meaning the kind of glory that all those united with Jesus will one day share. Or to put it in another way, what if Peter, James, and John, what if what they saw on that day in the face of Jesus was a mirror image of of their future selves. On that mountain of transfiguration, men were giving or were given a glimpse of what Jesus was like in heaven before he robed himself with human flesh. They were given a glimpse of what Jesus is right now in heaven and what he will be like when he returns as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But don't miss it. We're also on this mountain giving, we're given a glimpse of what we will be like. When we see Jesus' face burst with light, on this mountain, we are invited not only to recognize how utterly different Jesus is from us as the divine Son of God, but we are also invited to recognize how we will be like Him. We'll be like Him if we follow Him from this mountain of glory to the cross. If we follow Him to the cross, we will be like Him. But here's the deal, brothers and sisters, the transfiguration calls us to reject Peter's attempt to stay safe and comfortable. That's what Peter wanted to do. Let's just stay here. Let's stay safe. Jesus, you can just stay right here. You don't have to go to the cross. We are so tempted for comfort and for safety. And instead, the transfiguration calls us to embrace Anything that might come into our lives as a result of us following Jesus while also embracing the path that leads to glory. Not just His glory, but our glory as well. There is no greater encouragement when we feel the cost of following Christ than to look ahead and see where this path, this, this path of following Christ is sometimes difficult. It is sometimes difficult painful but we get to look ahead and see how it's going to end the path of discipleship the path of following christ it might be costly at times it might be painful at times but it will end in glory it will end in glory I want to show you one more verse in 1 John 3, 2. In fact, we looked at it uh, last year when we walked through 1 John. But 1 John 3, 2 says this. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when He appears, and if you see it on the, the screen, say it with me. We shall be like Him. Because we shall see him as he is. Listen, his glory is an invitation for us to bow our knee to him. To who he is. He is the glorious one. He is our glorious savior. He did not um, entreat himself and keep that glory. Instead, he laid that glory aside again to head to the cross. But it's also a promise to us in the midst of every difficulty, every pain, every struggle in this life that glory is coming. In fact, 
Think about this. Romans 8, 28. We love, we, we love quoting that verse. All things work together uh, for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And that is absolutely true. But sometimes we miss the deal of what is that good? What is the good? All God, all things work together for good. What is the good? And we might say, well, it's God's doing or God's work. Here's the truth, brothers and sisters. God tells us in the next verse what the good is. And it says this, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. So everything we go through, God has promised to work it together for good. And the good is that through the pain, through the difficulty, and even through the good times, we are becoming more and more like Jesus. And that is the good. That is good for us now. That is good for us tomorrow. That is good for us next week, next month, next year. And one day when we stand before him face to face, that will be the ultimate good for our lives. Amen, Amen, brothers and sisters. Amen. We're going to go ahead and pray and then we're going to end with a time of, of worship, just declaring how good our God is and just praising his name together. So let us pray. Father, we come before you. We praise your name. We thank you for this time. God, we thank you for the beautiful picture of your glory that we see on this mountain. Jesus, you are glorious. You are glorious. Glory to your name as we sang earlier. Help us, oh God, not to miss that glory. Help us to stand in awe of your glory. If there's anyone listening who has never bowed their knee to that glory, may today be the day of salvation in their lives. Lord, may today be the day that people see Jesus for who He is and what He has done, that He has accomplished the plan of God, that Jesus did not stay on that mountain radiating glory. Instead, He laid again that glory aside in order to to follow through and finish the plan of God in Him going to the cross, which is what we're celebrating this week, but yet it goes even more than that he didn't just go to the cross he conquered death and the grave Father, i just pray whatever we're going through today that we would look beyond it to the glory that's coming there is glory that's coming nothing that we're going through is meaningless god you are working it conforming us now into the image of your Son, and one day we will be like Him, for we will see Him as He is. Oh, Lord, how we need You. As we sang, Lord, we so thankful that we are Your children. There's a place for us with You. But yet, this is eternal life, that we can know You now. Oh, we praise You. Jesus name Amen
blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. 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 pray that it has been a good time of worship for each and every one of us. Um, just a couple of reminders. We have our devotionals at noon, Monday through Friday. Um, we have our drive-in service on Easter here at 10 a.m., our Good Friday service on Friday at 7. Um, if you need us for anything, we are here for y'all. Um, that is all I got. You may be dismissed to go to the bathroom or to the kitchen or wherever part of the house you may like to roam. We love you and Jesus loves you. Yeah, yeah.